Good evening and welcome to tonight's program of the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club. It is my very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, author of six New York Times bestsellers, including her most recent and most sobering book, Fascism, A Warning. Throughout her distinguished diplomatic career, Dr. Albright has been a voice of strength and reason during historic and difficult times, from the turnover of Hong Kong to China to dealing with Iraq and North Korea. She has also been a champion for advancing women in public service. Dr. Albright was our first female Secretary of State and at the time the highest ranking woman ever to have served in the US government. Dr. Albright also served as the US representative to the United Nations. In recognition of her many contributions to promoting international peace and democracy, in 2012, President Obama awarded Dr. Albright the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. She is currently the chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm, and Albright Capital Management, LLC, an investment advisory firm for, focused on emerging markets. She also teaches both undergraduates and graduate students at Georgetown University. Secretary Albright is a renowned collector of jewelry through which she sometimes communicates serious messages. A wonderful exhibit of her jewelry titled Read My Pins was held at the Legion of Honor Palace in San Francisco last year. And we will definitely ask her about the pin that she's wearing tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Madeleine Albright. Thank you so much for uh, introducing me and telling everybody who I am, because not everybody always knows. So I, not, I somehow yeah, doubt that. But. Not, not long ago, I was coming back from China, and Chicago was the first port of entry, and I was there getting undressed for the security people, and uh, <laughs> I, I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt, and the lady behind me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? My bottles all leak. And so I said I got them at the container store. And then I start going through the magnetometer. And the TSA guard looks at me. And he says, oh my god, it's you. Uh, <laughs> he said, I'm from Bosnia. And we all love you in Bosnia. And if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia. And you're welcome in Bosnia. And then he said, can I have my picture taken with you? And I said, sure. So the, how the line gets screwed up. And so uh, I go back to get my stuff. And the lady of the screw top bottle said, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State. And she said, of Bosnia? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for being with us this yeah. evening. Thank you. <laughs> You've written a very sobering book. And we're going to talk about yeah. that. but. I had mentioned your pin collection and how you speak through your pins. What are you wearing this evening and what is it saying to us? Well, tonight I'm wearing Mercury the Messenger, which seemed like an appropriate um, uh, pin to wear. But just to tell you how it all started, um, I clearly like jewelry. And when I got to the United Nations in February 93, um, it was the end of the Gulf War. And the ceasefire had been translated into a series of uh, uh, sanctions resolutions, and I was an instructed ambassador. And my instructions were to make sure the sanctions stayed on. And so every day I said something terrible about Saddam Hussein, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. So then um, all of a sudden there was a poem that appeared in the papers in Baghdad, comparing me to many things, but among them, an unparalleled serpent. So I had a snake pin, and I decided to wear it whenever we talked about Iraq. And so I think you've all seen how the ambassadors come out and talk to the press. And so a camera focuses and says, why are you wearing that snake pin? 
And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out <laughs> and I bought a lot of costume jewelry. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, I wore insects and carnivorous animals. And the other ambassadors noticed it and they'd say, what are we gonna do today? And the first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I said, read my pins. And that's how it all started. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Right. So <laughs> what is the winged mercury saying to us tonight? Well, I think that my book is Fascism, A Warning. Uh, and I do think that um, there are many aspects that we need to look at in terms of what is going on um, internationally and domestically um, in terms of some aspects that worried me. And I was planning to write this book no matter what because I was beginning to see uh, what was going on in Europe. I have uh, been somebody that has spent my academic as well as my political life kind of looking at changes in Central and Eastern Europe and changes after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and then I do travel around the United States a lot and um, spend a lot of time uh, giving speeches and talking to people. And, and I have the sense more and more that there were people both in Europe and in the United States and in, other, um, in Asia and in Latin America who uh, were feeling victimized by what was going on. Uh, they had, some of them had lost their jobs um, as a result of technology. Some of them felt that they had been ignored completely. Uh, and you could tell kind of an undercurrent that they felt that they were not being paid attention to in any way. And I thought it was worth really looking at it. And so um, I have spent a lot of my life looking at history. And um, this is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And kind of looking at what were some of the things that were going on after that war and um, during the 30s, and were there certain aspects that we needed to take a look at? And so the book is actually has a lot of history in it, uh, goes back and looks at Mussolini and Hitler, but then also I spend time looking at uh, Hungary and Poland and Turkey, um, the Philippines, Venezuela, and just kind of generally are these symptoms uh, out there also in other countries in terms of um, dissatisfied people who don't, who feel that their attention, that they're not getting the attention they need? So we're going to go back and look at this history and concerns about today, but I, because I think it's on everybody's mind now, could we talk about the North and South Korea situation for just a moment? Start yes. there and then uh, go back uh, from uh, there. I'm glad. And by the way, the only country that I have actually said is fascist is North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but let me just say this. Um, during the Clinton administration, we really spent a lot of time on North Korea. And one of the first early things in 93-94, um, the North Koreans uh, were signatories of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but they were threatening to pull out of it. And so we began to work in trying to figure out what they were doing, why they were doing it. Um, I was at the UN at the time, and it was interesting because um, the North Korean um, representative came in there and started complaining about the horrible things that the United States was doing. And one of the things that um, is, when you're giving um, your uh, explanation of vote or whatever you're doing at the UN, um, uh, you have to kind of contain yourself not to get furious when somebody's attacking your country. So it was just a couple of days before my birthday, and so I said, I'd like to thank the representative of North Korea for making me feel 40 years younger with his speech out of the Cold War. Um, and so it was really a very angry time. We then tried to figure out how to get some control over what was going on, and I won't go through the whole history, but there was something called the Agreed Framework, which was supposed to limit what they were doing, uh, and a number of things that were, there were constantly something going on. So in 98-99, um, President Clinton was concerned about what was happening, and he asked former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry to do a complete review of our North Korea policy. And Bill really did that, and he had a group of people, and they worked on it very hard. And, and he said to the North Koreans, because he went to Pyongyang, and he said, this is fork in the road time. Um, and you either uh, will negotiate over this, or we are prepared to use force. And they actually decided that they wanted to negotiate. So then what happened was and, uh, that there were talks at a number of different levels. And kind of in the late summer of 2000, the number two guy, Vice Marshal Cho, came to the United States 
Um, and he, uh, we went to the Oval Office, and he gave President Clinton an invitation for him to come to North Korea. And President Clinton did what I thought was appropriate, was he'd said, maybe I'll go at some point, but we need to prepare this, and so I'm going to send the Secretary of State. They weren't real happy about that. Uh, and I had no idea what was going to happen. And I won't go through all of it, but we spent a lot of time negotiating. Um, and his, the father of the current guy, Kim Jong-il, was very smart. Um, and um, the, the truth is that I had been told by our intelligence community that he was crazy and a pervert. Uh, I found out he wasn't crazy. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and... So uh, what happened was I'm sitting in the guest house. We have no embassy. I had no idea what we were going to do. And all of a sudden, I get a message that I have to go and see his embalmed father. So I went to the mausoleum. And that's much harder than it looks, because if you bow too low, then the American press will say you're being obsequious. And if you don't bow low enough, you haven't accomplished anything. So I must have had the right angle, because when I got back to uh, the guest house, they said the dear leader will see you. And so we had a press conference, which was like something out of the 50s. And I'm standing next to him, and I see we're the same height. And I look over, and I had on high heels, and so did he. Um, and, and his hair was a lot poofier than mine. Um, but the bottom line is we did spend a lot of time having serious negotiations. And when I left, uh, we were in the middle of negotiating. The plan was to continue the negotiations, and at that time is, it was over ballistic missile limits. Uh, and the talks began in Kuala Lumpur. This was, I was there in October, and then there was the election of 2000. Um, and I had briefed Colin Powell on what we were doing. He was very interested in doing it, um, and he wanted to continue. And then there was a headline in the Washington Post that said, Powell to continue Clinton policies on North Korea. He was hauled into the Oval and told no way. So I hold no brief for the North Koreans, but we were in the middle of talks. I think now what is very important, I'm very glad that the diplomatic talks have begun. Even in our day, it was the South Koreans, President Kim Dae-jung, who was the real leader initially. So what President Moon of um, South Korea is doing now and the meeting that just took place, um, it was really quite fascinating to watch. Uh, but the South Koreans have played and should play an important role. Um, and I'm very glad that diplomatic talks have begun because I think that's the only solution to it. What I'm nervous about, and the reason I went through this whole story, is that we spent a lot of time preparing for talks. And we had a lot of people that actually understood North Korea. And what I'm troubled by is that the State Department has been gutted um, and the bottom line is the guy that was in charge of, South Cor of North Korean um, activities has left. Um, and so if you're going to do diplomacy, you need diplomats. And so the question is, even if President Trump does have a meeting, it, it'll be the beginning and an awful lot of work. And I am, um, you know, people ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And so uh, I am worried in terms of uh, all the details that have to be carried out. But it is a very, I think it's an important step forward. Um, and I very much hope that they can resolve what are very, very deep problems in terms of North Korea being a nuclear power. Do you think it's significant that the action is between the North Korean and South Korean leaders? The U.S. is not directly involved yeah. at this point. What's the symbolism of that, that they are sort of taking the initiative on their own? Well, well I, I think it's important, actually. But what is interesting, in South Korea, they have had a political debate um, in their political system. And they have flipped kind of from conservative presidents to those that are more interested in this kind of outlook. And President Moon made very clear when he was running he was interested in this. Um, and so I think it, I actually think it's fine. And I think one of the issues generally is how to have this be not just us negotiating. The Japanese have to get involved in this also. The problem that we have uh, with that part of the world and our allies, we have an alliance with the Japanese and an alliance with the South Koreans. They just happen to dislike each other. So that makes it uh, complicated. But they're both threatened. And so I do think that, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's important that the South Koreans took a lead. 
But the, question, the thing that's been out there all along is the North Koreans want recognition by the United States, and they want to have a peace treaty with the United States, and that's why ultimately we are going to have to uh, play the lead role in it. You mentioned the um, hollowing out of the State Department. We have another new Secretary of State. It's become a little bit of a revolving door, and there is this sense that positions are not being filled, the State Department has empty offices and echoing corridors and so on. Could you say a little bit about that, how much of that is true? And again, what is the significance of this uh, more broadly for American diplomacy? Well, first of all, um, the State Department is the, the lead department. The Secretary of State is the senior member of the cabinet. Um, and um, I, I teach a course at Georgetown, and I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. So what are the tools? And there are not a lot of tools in the toolbox, but diplomacy is the major tool, bilateral and multilateral. And then there are the economic tools and the, the use of force tools and intelligence. So diplomacy is the main tool to work on it with. Um, and the thing that I think a lot of people are not aware of is the discrepancy in the budget. Uh, so I know you have a defense background, but the bottom line is, and I believe in a strong defense, but the budget for the Defense Department is around $700 billion, and the budget for the State Department is now something like $39 billion. Um, and so, um, and with that $39 billion, we have to pay the diplomats, have programs, have security of the buildings, pay our dues to international organizations, so it's not a lot of money. And the thing that happened was initially this budget of this low number was proposed by the, uh, the administration, and when former Secretary Tillerson went to the Hill and the members of Congress wanted to give him more money, he didn't want it. In addition to that, there was a freeze on hiring, um, and there were people, and the other part, I had been to a rather peculiar ceremony in January, um, organized by the U.S. Institute of Peace, which was passing the baton, and I was sitting with a, a bunch of Republicans from the Heritage Foundation, and I overheard them saying, we can't have all those people that worked for the previous administration. I'm not, they were saying they're not loyal Americans, and it made me so crazy that I interrupted, and I said, uh, what do you mean? These are professionals that have worked for a lot of uh, administrations, but there was a sense that a lot of people needed to go, and then there were people who actually wanted to go, and then the part that I'm really worried about, um, that because of the hiring freeze and because of what's going on, the pipeline is being cut off, because my students, for instance, um, who usually are taking foreign service exams are saying they aren't sure they want to go into the foreign service. So there might be, in 25 years, a whole lack of people that don't have the background of diplomats. So I'm very worried about it. And I have to say, the only part that really encouraged me in, in uh, Pompeo's um, hearings was that he talked about the need of putting money back into the State Department, understanding the importance of diplomacy and democracy programs. And I think we'll have to see how he carries out his work on that, because we can't do diplomacy without diplomats. So um, you mentioned your students. And now getting back to the book you've just published, um, it quotes a lot from your students. Uh, you use them sort of as uh, examples of thinking and, and draw on their wisdom. Do you, do you find your students have wisdom? And what, so This is fairly unique to draw on the ideas of young people this way. Well, let me just say there isn't a book or a speech that's ever given that Robert Frost isn't quoted. So uh, uh, the bottom line is Robert, and I have this in my book, Robert Frost said, the older I get, the younger my teachers are. So I'm definitely in that position. Um, but the bottom line is I find my students, and the, the ones that are in the book were graduate students, and a number of them come from different countries, and uh, obviously most of them are Americans, and I uh, talk to them a lot about what they see going on, and um, one of the things that um, made me very nervous, because we were trying to do definitions of fascism, and that's not easy, but I asked whether they thought that fascism could ever come to the United States, and they thought yes. 
And most recently, I was on a program with Smirkonish, and his last question was, you know, he always does that kind of question at the end, did people think that fascism could take a hold in the United States? And according to the answers, 77% people did, which really kind of surprised me, more than surprised me. Um, I like dealing with my students because I do learn from them, and I am both encouraged by what they think and do, but discouraged because in some ways they don't want to take an active role um, in trying to fix things. And so what I'm most afraid of at the moment is that we're normalizing what's going on and that we don't fully understand what is happening. And so the book really does lay out a lot of steps. And um, as I said, it was historical. And I do begin with Mussolini. Um, and part of the issues that were going on are not dissimilar. People being dissatisfied either with the results of World War I or with their economic position. And one of the quotes, Mussolini, that I quote, that I think really gets to the bottom of all of this, he said, as he was gaining power, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, people don't notice. And so I'm trying to figure out what's plucking, the, you know, what is going on with the chicken plucking. Uh, so uh, I do think that's one of the aspects, that there are lessons in all of this. But the students, uh, it was very interesting to get their points of view, um, and I do learn from them. I know what you mean, and I'm, you know, the CEO of the Commonwealth Club, and a number of our younger staff are here today, and I feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. We learn increasingly from them, yeah. particularly in the digital era, but from their knowledge and experience and yep, so that's on. That's for sure. The only thing, uh, speaking of the digital era and college, I went to college, I went to Wellesley, and I went uh, sometime between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire. Uh, and so uh, um, my... Uh, and, but I was very interested to know that uh, when the senators were um, inter uh, questioning Mark Zuckerberg, that they didn't know an awful lot about technology either. So uh, I think we all, there's a generation that is a problem. We are illiterate. Yeah. Um, let's start with basics. What is your definition of fascism? Well, first of all, it is a word that is uh, thrown out. Whenever you disagree with somebody, they're a fascist. Or if your teenage son wants to drive the car and you don't let him, he calls you a fascist. So um, the bottom line, it is thrown around. And so I've kind of come up with the following uh, definitions. Um, first of all, a fascist leader is somebody who identifies with one group, uh, usually some tribal kind of aspect, nationalist group, and uh, they are some of the people that have been dissatisfied. And so the identification is with that group at the expense of the other group um, that is uh, robbed of its uh, individual rights. And then that leader is willing to use any tool in order to gain power. So that's the definition of a leader. But fascism itself is this initial division of us versus them. Um, and really um, exacerbating that division more and more. Then it, fascism also has no use for any democratic institutions. Uh, it has no respect for uh, a free press of any kind. Um, and then also uh, what it does is uh, the leader and the, the whole system uses propaganda in a way and rallies and salutes and uniforms to kind of get people fully um, motivated in what they're doing. And they come up, uh, fascism thinks it has fairly simple answers for the problems. Um, and, but it's basically this disrespect for any institutions and the us versus them, instead of trying to find common um, cause and trying to develop uh, a common view, it is specifically designed to divide people even more. Um, and then what it does is um, never want to discuss, um, never look into what the other people believe in. So, and it, it will use anything to get power, and it's really a system that will use violence uh, ultimately to achieve what it wants. Your book, Prague Spring, was terrific. And um, in it, you describe your personal experience of fascism or your and your family's experience of fascism. But can you just talk a little yeah. bit about what you personally saw and experienced in your family experience during World War II and the years just after? 
Well, um, one of the other reasons I wanted to write the book was because of the personal experience. And so I was born in Czechoslovakia in 1937. And in 1938, the Munich Agreement happened. And uh, it's kind of a watershed event for Czechoslovakia because this was a new country um, that was created in 1918. Uh, and I might uh, just parenthetically, um, it, the U.S. had a huge influence in it, Woodrow Wilson, or as the Czechs call him, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what happened was that the first president of Czechoslovakia uh, married an American, um, Thomas Masaryk. He married an American woman called Charlotte Gehrig, and he took her maiden name as his middle name. If you can imagine a marriage that took place in the last quarter of the 19th century, this happened. And the Czechoslovak Constitution is modeled on the American one with one addition. It had equal rights language in it in 1918. So this was kind of a model democracy. But what happened was that it did have a German minority, which in the 37-38 period was propagandized by a disciple of Hitler's. And there really was this sense that um, the outside powers didn't want to deal with it. And so what happened where the British and French made a deal with the Germans and Italians over the head of the Czechoslovaks uh, and said that Hitler could take, take that peace. And that's kind of the way appeasement became a, a, a code word for everything. But it really destroyed Czechoslovakia. And then the Nazis marched in in March 1939. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat. And um, the government in exile was forming in London, and so we escaped at that time to London. I spent the war in um, London all through the Blitz, um, and so, um, and understood, and for me, the main theme has always been, where's America? And America was not there at Munich, and terrible things happened. And then I remember uh, when the Yanks came into London, and that's when I first fell in love with Americans in uniform, and it really made a mm -hmm. difference. And then what happened after the war was that um, as a result of agreements made, um, Czechoslovakia and the countries to the east were liberated, liberated in quotation marks, by the Red Army instead of by Americans. And so a lot in terms of fighting fascism and various things, I felt, and I still do, that the United States does have a role in doing this. I much later in life found out that uh, I have a very uh, interesting background. I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. So um, <laughs> I have my interreligious dialogue myself. Um, but uh, I also later found out that 26 members of my family died in the Holocaust. And part of the other aspect of a definition of fascism is that it always has to be somebody else's fault. There has to be a scapegoat. Uh, and that is one of the signs that I think one has to look for, especially in terms of the things that are happening in Europe, where the, the refugees, the migrants, are blamed for everything, um, and to some extent in the United States. And so I think that my own family personal experience with uh, right-wing fascism of the Germans, and then I think communists are fascists also. Um, and so then we had to leave because the communists had taken over Czechoslovakia. And so I really do have a sense that one has to stand up to things. And we all know that statement now, which is see something, say something. I've added to it, do something. And so that's my book. And um, it took me a long time to uh, develop a voice, and I'm not going to shut up now. Thank goodness. Yep. We appreciate yeah. that. What if um, the U.S. or other actors could have done a few things during the rise of fascism before and during World War II? What were the turning points? What could have been done differently? Well, by I, the US, I think what is Britain? interesting, let me just say, um, I do think that it requires um, international action to try to stop terrible things from happening. And frankly, the lesson out of World War I was the creation of the League of Nations. Um, and the fact that the United States, <clears throat> even though Woodruff Will Wood Woodrow Wilson uh, was really the author of great parts of the League of Nations, the United States did not enter. 
Um, and so what happened in America um, that I think we need to pay attention to now, there became an isolationist trend. And I, I find this country history so fascinating in so many ways because um, there's every possibility that the U.S. can avoid doing things. George Washington and the Farewell Address kind of indicated that getting involved in entangling alliances was not a good idea. So we go back and forth between being involved um, and or waiting too long, as I think what happened with World War I, but definitely in the 30s, there was a, a way that the U.S. pulled back. Um, and even though Woodrow Wilson was pushing on things and there were various ways of trying to end war, we were not around at all. And I think that's, that's something, uh, but not, we don't have to do things alone. And I think that the lesson out of that is that countries that care about their individual rights and democracy need to um, have partnerships and operate together. What I've learned uh, is Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. Uh, but basically, all it is is partnerships. And so that's the kind of thing that I think we need to be looking for now. But to look at those uh, feathers that basically are that there is, I think it, it's not a secret that there are divisions in any society. The question is how you deal with them. And do you deal with them in some way to bring people together or to exacerbate those divisions? And so that's what really happened in the 30s. And the US decided to be America first. Uh, and that really we were not going to play any role. And I think the world suffered for a long time until the US came in. So exterior to the US, at the moment, looking around the world, uh, where do you see fascism rearing its head where, as you say, a, a group in the society is disaffected, uh, there's uh, the, the various elements of fascism you've yeah. described? Well, I think, unfortunately, um, a lot is happening in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm trying to figure out why, actually, this is going on. And, uh, to go back to um, the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, the countries in Central and Eastern Europe were founded on the basis of national identity. They had been a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they wanted to have a national identity. So I think um, I can uh, say that I was also involved in being part of the euphoria after the wall came down thinking that these countries really wanted to be a part of Europe um, and that they could be a part of Europe. But it was much harder, I think, in terms of the economic situation and kind of the facelessness of the European Union. And so uh, what happened was, and the countries that are now the biggest problem, Hungary. Hungary is a perfect example of this. They felt that they had lost their, a lot of territory after the end of World War I. They were dissatisfied. Um, and um, and they, what is interesting, I think they're the closest at the moment to really, I don't call anybody a fascist, by the way, except the North Koreans, but, but I do think that there are very serious fascist tendencies in Hungary, where Viktor Orban, who has been prime minister, um, has in fact um, uh, vilified anybody who's not an ethnic Hungarian. He has found a scapegoat who's George Soros, um, who has, uh, is a Hungarian uh, and a Jew. And so he has uh, said that he is the evil person. Uh, by the way, what is ironic, Viktor Orban was one of the leading dissidents, and he was funded by George Soros to go and study at Oxford, um, which somehow he's forgotten. But mostly what has happened is they have turned the immigrants into the scapegoats. Um, and so that is part of the problem. And Poland also, frankly, um, in terms of undermining what the judiciary is um, and, again, blaming others from the outside. Turkey uh, is an example. And one of the tragedies, and by the way, I think the thing that really comes out in reading my book is that um, Mussolini and Hitler came to power constitutionally. In Italy, uh, King Emmanuel gave Mussolini the power. In Germany, Hindenburg gave Hitler um, the power. Uh, and the others that I talk about were elected. In Hungary, there have been elections. And in Turkey, Erdogan was elected. 
Um, and I think the thing to watch out for is that um, Turkey, um, I, I've always been known as a Turkophile, but basically um, what happened was that Turkey either had military coups or was run by a bunch of fancy people that lived on the other side of the Bosporus, um, and Erdogan ran as a populist. He, his party, AKP, delivered uh, constituency services, and he won fair and square. Um, and so now he's doing what fascists do, which is change the constitution uh, and take advantage of uh, accumulating power. So Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Philippines, Duterte, uh, in the way that he is uh, seizing power, and, and frankly in Venezuela. What is very interesting, Venezuela also, when we were in office, was run by a bunch of tired old men that had no relationship with the indigenous peoples. Um, and Chavez comes in, and all of a sudden he is willing to create a poor people's fund and do things, and power went to his head also. He began to think he was Bolivar. So um, I do think that there are these trends that really need to be looked at. Turning to the U.S., what signs of concern do you see? Yeah. Well, let me just make something perfectly clear, because I'm asked about this. I am not calling Donald Trump a fascist. I do think he's the most undemocratic president in modern American history, um, and that he um, does not recognize the importance of the press in any shape or form. And to call the press the enemy of the people is stunning to me, because having a free press is you know, not the enemy of democracy. We invented the free press, and so I think that part. I think also having no regard for institutions, um, and especially the judicial branch uh, of, uh, you know, being critical of judges that are uh, not, uh, that have mixed background, um, packing the court and various aspects of that. I think also um, what is going on that troubles me is this um, exacerbation of the divisions that we saw and we continue to see it and it's a us versus them, and kind of forgetting that our Constitution begins with we, the people. Um, and then basically doing some of these things of these rallies and um, making uh, an atmosphere where um, it brings people out in anger um, and, in fact, uh, in some ways approves of violence that begins to take place. So for me, the major issue is that there is no respect for people that have different views, um, and this disrespect for any democratic institutions and the exacerbation of that. That is what worries me in the feather plucking. And so uh, those are the things that I'm calling out. And the things that are on my to-do list um, is basically that um, I think it's important for people not to normalize what's going on, and I think we have to be very active. I hope people run for office at all levels, uh, local and uh, state and federal. I think that those people that are not running for office should support those that do, um, and, and um, recognize the privilege of voting. I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. I go abroad to observe elections. There are people who stand in the rain or the sun for the privilege of voting, and here people think it doesn't count. And to go back to my students, they kind of say, well, my vote doesn't count. That is not true. Um, every vote counts, and we've got to get the vote out and register people. Um, uh, and then what I really think needs to happen is we all have to make sure that we are not in an echo chamber as far as um, information is concerned. Now, you should all be glad that you don't live in Washington, D.C., uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, but basically, uh, because um, I listen to right-wing radio as I drive, uh, and I do a lot of yelling and give various <laughs> um, hand signals. Um, and, um, and, but I do think that people need to uh, listen to the things that they disagree with. And the other thing that I fully urge is, I don't like the word tolerance, because it means tolerate, to put up with. And I think we need to respect other views and not um, really kind of uh, not have, I, I wanna know why people 
voted the way they did or what their problem was. Um, and the bottom line is, um, I, in case you haven't guessed, I am a card-carrying Democrat, um, but I think we lost contact with our base. And so I think we need to understand more what is going on and have respectful uh, relationships uh, with those we disagree with. And finally, I think we do need to learn from the children because what the children after the killing in Florida, they are the ones that went out and marched um, and we need to support them. <clears throat> And by the way, I do think there needs to be a really uh, important relationship between the millennials and those of us that don't like to be called old, so I call us perennials, uh, and that we need to have that relationship. Not to um, minimize this, but somebody in the audience wanted to know, if you were meeting with Donald Trump, what pin would you wear? Okay. By the way, I would not be meeting with him. He's not interested in meeting with me. Um, and, um, and I think that one of the things that I think is truly important and is a real sign of leadership is the capability of listening. And I don't see too much of that going on. So do Secretary of State... Um, or to be Pompeo, or, or he is, or Secretary yeah. Mattis. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Secretary Mattis ever call on you for advice? Well, <clears throat> let me say um, just to go back on something. One of the really important parts that I found when I was secretary was having a lot of communication with my predecessors, um, because we really all had the same job and felt a great sense of responsibility. And by the way, the first person to call me when I became Secretary of State was Henry Kissinger. And he said, Madeline, you have taken away my one unique characteristic of being an immigrant Secretary of State. And I said, no, Henry, I don't have an accent. You know, so, uh, but he said, welcome to the fraternity. And I said, it's not a fraternity anymore. Uh, 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 but um, I do think that I spent a lot of time with Secretary Schultz and um, with Secretary Christopher at the time, and what we really had a, 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 a group that cared about what we did in representing our country. So I did call uh, Secretary Tillerson when he was named um, and uh, congratulated him. He said, I'll get back to you if I'm confirmed, and he didn't. Um, uh, I do have to say that uh, Pompeo did call me uh, to say that he wanted to get together. Secretary Mattis does call on me, and I am a part of the Defense Policy Board, uh, which is a bipartisan board. Um, and so I'm very happy to be called on, um, and I do think that we have a responsibility to be helpful, but um, uh, I'm not there kind of saying, listen to me, listen to me. I do believe in a bipartisan foreign policy, um, and I proved that by being friends with Jesse Helms. Um, and um, we did a lot of things together, uh, and I now do a lot of uh, task, bipartisan task forces. I've just done a long one on the Middle East with Steve Hadley, and so I do believe in a bipartisan foreign policy. Do you watch Madam Secretary? Well, you don't know about my television career. No. Um, so what happened was when I first got out of office, I got a call from the producers of Gilmore Girls, um, and they said, would I mind if uh, somebody played me? And I said, I said, yes, I would mind. I want to play myself. <laughs> so uh, I was on Gilmore Girls. Wow. Um, and then I got a call from Parks and Recreation uh, because Amy Poehler, there was some scene where she had a picture of me on the desk and somebody comes in to ask her for a date and, she, and this person says, is that your grandmother? And she said, if you don't know who Madeleine Albright is, I'm not gonna date you. So anyway, but Madam Secretary, the story is that Taylor called me up and she wanted to know what it was like to be Secretary of State. So we had breakfast and I was talking to her and I thought, what, am I having this serious conversation about this? And then the writers came over and they wanted to know uh, what were the kinds of issues, and I kind of uh, rationalized that I watch a lot of crazy TV because it brings issues to the people. Uh, so I used to watch Army Wives or whatever. So, um, but anyway, I talked to them about the issues, and then uh, what happened was that um, 
uh, she, uh, they asked me to go, we all, actually, tomorrow night is the White House Correspondents' mm -hmm. Dinner, which is a serious issue, and I was invited by CBS and her to go to, as their guest. And every time somebody said, Madam Secretary, she would turn around. Uh, <laughs> but I was on Madam Secretary, and I did an episode, and I played myself. Um, and uh, I actually couldn't do television for a living for, because this tiny little cameo took five hours to film. But, so I do watch Madam Secretary. So let's go back to talking about uh, young people and uh, the absence of experienced diplomats. A couple of folks here tonight want to know what can the younger generation do to bridge the passion, their passion and drive with the wisdom of the older generation? What do you recommend for our future to encourage and educate a new generation to go into diplomacy and public service? Well, I, I do think that um, this generation <clears throat> that's coming up and is involved, I, I am kind of blown away by my class of people that have actually studied abroad or speak a language um, and want to continue having some kind of international experience. And I think we need to encourage that of having, you know, by the way, globalization is not a four-letter word. And so having a global approach, uh, it, this is a generation that is just made for that in so many different ways. I think the question is how to marry that with public service. I happen to actually believe in some of the ideas about a national service. Um, I think that, there, that people may not have to go into the military, but there are any number of ways that, that young people can uh, return um, the great life that we have here. And so I hope that there's more of that, and that they can be persuaded that having them inv uh, actively involved is something where they will make a difference. So they do have kind of a global attitude already, and I'd like to see that. I also would like to see, to make sure that programs like the Fulbright program go on. I am president of the Truman Foundation, and they are people that um, are very interested in public service. And I think we really should encourage that, but encourage them to be involved domestically and internationally, and to understand that domestic and foreign policy go together. So back to the U.S. situation more generally, how plucked is the chicken? What, what percentage of the chicken is plucked? Well, um, it's got a bald head. Uh, uh, but I think that... It be a bald eagle. That, uh, but I do think, um, I think we are, um, I, I, I am worried about what we started with, saying that, that my students thought that, that fascism could take place here. Therefore, I think that to go back to my to-do list, we're about to see an election. And I think that this is the one that really could show that we've got to stop plucking the chicken and that democracy is alive and well. I have a paradox in my book, which is I believe in the resiliency of democracy, but I also am concerned about the fragility of democracy. And we're talking about my background. And when we came to the United States, my father uh, was teaching at the University of Denver. And he said, uh, there is nothing better than to be a professor in a free country. But the thing he said, even shortly after we got here, was he said that he was concerned that Americans took democracy for granted. Uh, and we can't do that. And so I think that, that what needs to happen now is a lot of activity so that the plucking stops and that, in fact, uh, there is more activity and an understanding that the, our Constitution does begin with we and that there is a responsibility about being a citizen uh, that, would, that a lot of people are not aware of, that it doesn't just happen, that we really have to push on it. We're here at the Commonwealth Club, which is the largest, most active public forum in the country. Uh, we think about this. What can we do to best facilitate crossing the divide that we see in our country today? What do you think a group like the Commonwealth Club can do? Well, I do think uh, uh, we need to talk to people we disagree with. And you may be surprised about this, but I hope you invite people that you disagree with. We do. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, listen to those with different views um, and disagree with them. But, I, but from a basis of logic and not anger, 
Um, and I think we also all ought to make an effort to try to talk to people we disagree with in a civil way. I also can understand fully that it is difficult to, uh, under to figure out what the truth really is uh, because uh, our media are not do doing as much as they used to in terms of having kind of common channels. Um, and there's an awful lot of different sources of information. So I think what has to happen is what uh, one used to do in terms of research is find uh, different sources and kind of do, not become a relativist, but, but uh, compare what is going on. So I do think we have a responsibility to seek after uh, information, as I said earlier, listen to those that we disagree with. But I do, I also think that there need to be more community discussions and analyze what's gone wrong here. Why is it that there are people that live in the United States that feel that they've been neglected? and that they, they are the victims of technology rather than the, uh, uh, the, the real, uh, those that benefit from it. And by the way, um, I, I, I apologize for plagiarizing, and I do, and I, from a, something that I learned in Silicon Valley lo not long ago, in what is happening in terms of information and technology. So people are talking to their governments on 21st century ten technology, the governments uh, listen to them on 20th century technology and provide 19th century responses. And so there's no faith in institutions, but we are the institutions. And so I think that getting people elected that will listen to what is going on, uh, have a sense about trying to find the common good. I am, I am a centrist, I definitely am, and I think we have to be careful of extremes uh, both on the right and on the left because we can't get anything done. And so I do think that a group such as the Commonwealth Club can encourage these kinds of discussions um, and in small or large groups, but be willing to listen to those with whom we disagree and have civil discussions. Thank you. Say a little bit more about this relationship between the governed and the, and the government, the loss of the a contract, trust between them, the 21st century meeting the 19th century. Well, Say more that, about that. The thing that I am concerned about is <clears throat> that I do think the social contract is broken in so many ways. I mean, as we know from studying political philosophy, the people came together initially willing to give up a certain amount of their individual rights in order to be protected by the state. Um, and the bottom line is that both sides have failed. The state is not doing things like building roads and bridges and providing education. Uh, and the citizens are not doing their job by being active and voting and being a part of it and taking responsibility. I also think that there's always been something about technological innovation that has been a disruptor, the Industrial Revolution, et cetera. What I find interesting is that I think people did not pay attention to what technology was doing. And it's an incredible gift, there's no question, but it also has had the effect of people losing their jobs and our education system is not teaching people new skills. Um, and so there had those kinds of failures um, and the part that I'm most worried about is that we blame somebody else. And we haven't really talked about immigration. I'm a refugee uh, and a very grateful American. And so um, I think that what is happening, and this business uh, we talked about in terms of Hungary, but what's happened here with our uh, policies now of um, not letting certain people into this country, or thinking that they are either terrorists or rapists, or um, is something that is destructive, and we're operating on the basis of the fear factor. We should be operating on the basis of the hope factor, <clears throat> and and I um, this is self-serving, but I think immigrants are very grateful Americans, and one of the things that um, I love doing is uh, going to naturalization ceremonies and. Um, and I can't swear people in because I'm not an officer of the law, but I can give them their naturalization certificates. So the first time I did it was on July 4th, 2000 at Monticello. I did have Jefferson's job, so 
thought I could. So I was giving a naturalization certificate, and all of a sudden I heard this man saying, can you believe I'm a refugee, and I got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State. So I went up to him and I said, can you believe that a refugee is Secretary right. of State? And that's what this country is really about. Right. Here's an interesting question. Um, what would you think, in terms of engaging younger people, what would you think of lowering the voting age to 16? Well, it's interesting, because I've been asked that question, and um, I think that um, it, it depends on the 16-year-old, frankly. <clears throat> Though I have to tell you, <clears throat> yesterday I was in um, Portland, and I was interviewed by two nine-year-old twins. <laughs> And it kind of blew my mind in terms of the things they already knew. And they probably would be better voters than some of the more recent ones. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I do think, however, that what is important is that there needs to be some basis of context to be a voter, whatever age. Um, and I think that those uh, young people that really get interested um, in government then I, uh, and kind of have uh, a real push for it, I, I would not be opposed to that, but not just kind of randomly and keep lowering it and lowering it, but I do think that it's important to think about getting young people more involved. And, and this may be kind of um, a shirking of obligation, but uh, um, <clears throat> the older generation has screwed things up, and so I think it's time to turn more to young people. Some municipalities have passed laws allowing uh, the voting age to go down in their in their cities. I believe Berkeley has done that, so really? that younger people uh, can be elected yeah. to well, I, local I think offices. that it that it does require an interest in an education, and not just. I wouldn't want to see young people just push to vote for somebody that they don't really understand. But if it creates the interest in finding out what the issues are and to find out why people disagree with it, then I would really be for it. What will it take for the U.S. to elect a female president? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> because the bottom line is, I have to say, we always think we're number one in everything. Um, the bottom line, there are many women presidents around the world. That's true. Um, and many more women in um, uh, policy positions. And it was interesting. Um, it hasn't been immediate. By the way, when I first got to the United Nations, um, it was one of the, there were 183 countries in the UN, and it was one of the first times I didn't have to cook lunch myself. So I asked my assistant to invite the women uh, ambassadors. So I get to my residence, and out of all those countries, there are um, six women there. Um, and so they're from Canada, Philippines, Kazakhstan, Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, and Liechtenstein, and me. Uh, so because I was the American, I created a caucus, and we called ourselves the G7. Um, uh, and uh, we supported each other in a number of things, and one of the things that we were concerned about was whether there would be women judges on the war crimes tribunal for the former Yugoslavia since most of the crimes were being committed against women. So our very powerful G7, we managed to get two women judges elected. Then uh, what happened, I wanted to do the same thing when I was secretary, and there were 14 women foreign ministers. Um, and so there are more and more women in um, positions of power. And um, when I became secretary, I made women's issues central to American foreign policy, not because I was a feminist only, but because we know that societies are more stable when women are politically and economically empowered. We had a terrific woman candidate. There will be other women candidates. There are an awful lot of women running for office now. Um, and I do think that it's encouraging, but it's time that we had the most capable people be president. So, uh, uh. What's the best piece of advice you can give to young women and girls today based on all of your experiences? Well, first of all, um, you have to work hard. And I don't wish to in, uh, insult anybody in this audience, but there's plenty of room for mediocre men in the world. There is no room for mediocre women. And so I do think that women have to work unbelievably hard. Um, I also do think that uh, we can't doubt each other so much. We are very judgmental about each other. 
Um, and one of the things, when I, I was traveling with Geraldine Ferraro when she was running for vice president, and we were somewhere in the Middle West, and this woman came up to me and said, how can she talk to a Russian? I can't talk to a Russian. Well, nobody was asking that woman to do that, and we have a tendency to project our own inadequacies on other women. And we, um, the most famous statement I ever made was that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. Here, here. Um, um, and it was so famous it ended up on a Starbucks cup. Uh, but it came from my own experience because I found other women very judgmental uh, when I was getting my PhD and I had children and they said, you know, why aren't you home? By the way, every woman's middle name is Guilt. Um, and, uh, you know, why aren't you home taking care of your children? And besides, my hollandaise sauce is so much better than yours. Um, and so we are not good to each other. And there's the queen bee syndrome. Uh, so I do think we need to be more helpful to each other. But by the way, I think, I'm often asked if I think the world would be better if it were only run by women. If you think that, you've forgotten high school. So the bottom line, uh, it's important to have uh, co-ed. Uh, leadership. <laughs> what was the most important thing you learned from your parents? Um, I think the most important, and given my parents' story of uh, the things that they went through in their lives, having come from fairly well-to-do families and then ending up as refugees um, living in boarding houses in London and then becoming uh, an ambassador and um, having a chef and a driver and then coming to the United States as refugees again um, is that uh, one needs to be grateful for whatever happens and my parents really made the abnormal seem normal uh, and I think that they did an incredible job in in living through some of the most difficult issues as I found out more about about my parents and the things that had happened to them I just felt terribly sorry for them given the decisions they had to make, but they loved coming to America, and they were very grateful to be here. And by the way, one of the things, we, we did spend the war in England, and the thing that happened was, uh, my father used to tell this story all the time, which was, when we were there, people would say, we're so sorry your country's been taken over by a terrible dictator, you're welcome here, what can we do to help you, and when are you going home? And when, when we came to the United States, people said, we're so sorry, your country's been taken over by a terrible system. You're welcome here. What can we do to help you? And when will you become a citizen? And my father said, that is what made America different. And those are the lessons that I learned from him. And then, uh, We are, unfortunately, getting to the end of our time, and I have one last question, which is, you spend time thinking about each of your books and uh, the, the focus you'll have during each period of time. What are you thinking about now? What is the next topic that you're going to address yourself to? Well, the thing that um, I do feel very strongly about what is going on now, and I describe myself as a grateful American, and I am troubled by what is going on, and so I am going to connect the dots of the various things I do um, in order to be activist. And as I said earlier, um, uh, it, it, it took me really till I was 55 and high-level jobs that I developed a strong voice. And I, I really do think I have an obligation to speak out. Um, and so um, even though I'm about to be 81, which is hard to admit, and this is the Antiques Roadshow, but uh, <laughs> the, the bottom line is that I really do plan to speak out, um, and I am going to try very hard to do what I'm preaching about, which is to talk to people that I disagree with, um, and to, I'm going to write another book, I'm going to do one which kind of pulls um, the various things that I've been doing since I left office. I am going to teach until I'm told not to. Um, and I'm going to kind of try to combine some of the, I believe an awful lot in um, that people at 70 and organizations need a little bit of refurbishment. And so I'm going to give some ideas that I can in terms of how some international institutions should be set up, how we participate. And the thing that I really would like to get at 
um, which I've mentioned now a couple of times, I so believe in the importance of America being involved. And even though President Clinton is the one, he said indispensable nation first, I said it so often that it became identified with me. And I believe that the US needs to be engaged, that we have a responsibility as the most power, we are not victims, we are the most powerful country in the world. And so I wanna talk about the importance of American leadership because we are the ones that can talk about the value system and democracy and respect for individuals. And that chair is empty at the moment and American leadership is needed on a moral foreign policy. Secretary Albright, thank you for speaking up, standing up, and doing a great deal. We truly appreciate your service and hope you will uh, be vocal and, and uh, effective for many, many years to come. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here and Gloria for your very good questions. And, and I do hope that we can all become very active because the world depends on a functional America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you to Secretary Albright. Thank you to those Thank you to those joining us on the radio and online. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California celebrating over 115 years of enlightened discussion is adjourned. <laughs>